Rise from the invocation. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this past Saturday where this institution changed well over a thousand lives. Please be with those that are departing to do other things, and please be with us today as we uh, discuss the business of this great institution. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sir, preliminary matters. Thank you. I'd like to ask Dr. Susan Fell and to her friends and family to come forward, please. Dr. Susan Fell, Director of Admissions and Records, began her St. Petersburg College career in 2001 when she was named Project Coordinator for Education and Student Services. And whereas Dr. Fell's ability and willingness to provide exceptional service to students was recognized almost immediately, and in 2005 she was named a Coordinator for the University Partnership Center. And whereas Dr. Fell became Executive Director of the St. Petersburg College Foundation in 2006, garnering prestige and recognition of the college throughout the community, state, and nation. And whereas Dr. Fell assumed her current leadership role in 2007, she's a problem solver who consistently leads by example, encouraging and promoting ideas within her department and equipping her front line with timely information to help students. And whereas Dr. Fell has admirably represented St. Petersburg College at statewide professional meetings and provided valuable input to the planning of St. Petersburg College graduation ceremonies. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college by Dr. Susan Fell and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Said resolution adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees, St. Petersburg College, this 19th day of May. 2015. I'm really going to miss my friends and family here at the college. It has been a wonderful ride. And it's so fitting that today I'm at the Seminole campus, which is where I began. Thank you all for your help and support over the years. I'm going to miss you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Trustees, and Dr. Law. I'm Jeff Kronschnabel, and I serve as the instructor in charge for our Public Policy and Administration Baccalaureate Degree Program. I'm here today to share an exciting collaborative partnership initiative with the City of Seminole and the St. Petersburg College, uh, known as the Frank Edmonds Public Policy Management Associate Program. This innovative and generous initiative was at the request of City Manager Frank Edmonds, who worked very closely with our own Jim Oliver, Dr. Jim Oliver. <coughs> On April 28th, the Honorable Mayor Leslie Waters and the City Council of Seminole unanimously passed this initiative. This outstanding opportunity honors the legacy of Mr. Edmonds, 20 plus years of service with the City of Seminole. This is a full-time job for our students. It's only for the students of St. Petersburg College and it's only for the public policy and administration students. One student per year positioned for the next 10 years. Starting pay is $30,000 plus benefits. 
who may apply. Students who have recently graduated or about to graduate may apply for this position through the City of Seminole. <laughs> the students selected will be rotated for maximum exposure and experience. They'll spend three months in administration, three months in public safety, three months in community development, and three months in public works. Plans are in place to have our first student begin employment on August 1st of this year. A huge thank you to the City of Seminole, the Honorable Mayor Leslie Waters, the entire City Council, and a very, very special shout out to City Manager Frank Edmonds and to our own Dr. Jim Oliver for their vision, their leadership, and their support making this exciting opportunity a reality. Thank you very much. Mayor Waters. Go first. Go first. Go first. Go first. <laughs> we rehearsed this, Jeff. <laughs> this, uh, this third of a million dollar program uh, is a continuation of a long history of partnership between the City of Seminole and St. Petersburg College. <clears throat> I think it shows that the two of us, together with the Chamber of Commerce and the various civic uh, organizations and social organizations in Seminole, are so much greater than the sum of our parts in service to this community. We challenge other municipalities in this county, the county itself, and then, and then beyond to follow this model uh, and help themselves and the college by providing a robust work experience for one of our outstanding graduates. Uh, here to present this program on behalf of the city is the, is the mayor of the city of Seminole, the Honorable Leslie Waters. Mayor Waters. First of all, thank you very much for coming to sunny Seminole this morning, Dr. Law. I appreciate you bringing the board of directors here, board of trustees. I'd like to invite uh, Frank Edmonds up, please. This uh, scholarship, this program initiative was named after Frank Edmonds, Frank Edmonds Public Policy Management Associate Program. He worked very uh, closely with the college, with Dr. Oliver and uh, others as far as putting this program together. It'll provide one <coughs> great opportunity to work for the city of Seminole for one year at a time, one student, one public administration uh, graduate. It's a 10-year program, as Dr. Oliver uh, just said, uh, and that we are really pleased to be uh, hosting, employing on a full-time basis uh, a student for one year. We named it after Frank because this was his idea. As far as I'm concerned, this is his capstone uh, project. This is his pro one of many capstone projects that Frank has attained, and he's, we're bringing it right into the finish line because Frank Edmonds is retiring in August of this year after 20 fine years. So. We're going to miss Frank, but as the college, uh, we will all move on, and we're certainly going to miss Dr. Oliver, who I've worked with for many years when I was in the legislature and certainly now on council. While I have everyone up here, everyone of importance in the room, uh, one more plaque for your wall. Oh my, you're going to have to move. You're just going to have to. I don't know what your uh, condo looks like, but I'm sure you're running out of walls or, or U-Haul storage, okay? Now, this one, however needs to be front and center because we have worked together, this city has worked together with you for 18 years on a wonderful partnership. You have always brought uh, such professionalism, enthusiasm, joy, always a smile, always looking at everything in a positive manner. Hang with me, this is a resolution I, and I am a mayor, so you know, there's a couple whereases. <laughs> A resolution of the City Council of the City of Seminole, Florida, recognizing Dr. James Oliver, Provost, St. Petersburg College, Seminole Campus. Whereas Dr. James Oliver has announced his retirement effective this month, and whereas Dr. Oliver has served as Provost, St. Petersburg College, Seminole Campus, for 18 years. And whereas Dr. Oliver continuously demonstrated civic leadership as the Greater Seminole Area Chamber of Commerce officer for many years, City of Seminole Charter Review Committee. We always asked them to be on our Charter Review Committee, look over our, our little constitution for the city. And an active participant in many of the city's special events and activities. And whereas Dr. Oliver and City Manager Frank Edmonds developed a strong partnership between St. Petersburg College and City of Seminole Government, enabling partnerships such as Seminole Community Library. SPC Habitat Trail, open access to the Seminole Recreation Center for the students, St. Petersburg College, University of Florida Dental School, and future development of the St. Petersburg College Bay Pines property. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Seminole, Florida, to congratulate Dr. James Oliver for all of his success as provost of the Seminole campus and extend the Council's best wishes for a healthy and happy retirement. The above and foregoing resolution upon motion by Councilor Edelman, who was here in the front row, and seconded by Vice Mayor Barnhorn, and certainly approved by all councilors who are uh, Roger Edelman, Councilor Edelman, Councilor Planamura, and Matthews are with me today. As duly approved and adopted this 12th day of May, 2015, Leslie Waters, Mayor. Here, here. All right. Before I give up the, before I give up the microphone, it's been 18 years in coming, and not only the counselors in, uh, that are in, with us today and the counselors that were unable to be with us today, and we also have distinguished city staff. We have our fire chief, Heather Burford. We have Michael Bryan, uh, director of the library, joint use library. We have uh, Harry Kine, administration. I think that's all. Who did I miss? Another Becky. Uh, who? Yeah. And Becky? Becky. Becky Gunter from the recreation. And all of us together want to officially give Dr. Jim Oliver a key to the city. I don't know who to invite up here. I'm afraid if I ask friends and family to come, with, it's uh, uh, Jim. Why don't you step over here? Yeah, sure. That that's cool. Um, we've got some work to do. Reading these whereas statements after a, a, a city uh, council like that—they that, do that for a living. Yeah, right? yeah. They're, they're very good at it. We're we're, we're new. Whereas Dr. James Oliver, who has served higher education for more than 45 years, first came to St. Petersburg College in 1989 as Vice President for Institutional and Program Planning. And whereas Dr. Oliver's creativity, innovative ideas, and leadership ability made him the logical choice to assume the provost position at the new Seminole campus in 1996 when it opened at the Seminole Mall. And whereas Dr. Oliver oversaw and participated in planning the new campus, now home to more than 7,100 students each term, he has spearheaded growth opportunities from groundbreaking in 1997 to the recent <coughs> openings of the 40-acre Natural Habitat Park, which preserves much of the natural beauty of the campus, and the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, which operates free public forums on local and regional issues, such as water preservation and affordable health care. Early on, his natural curiosity led him to, to the procurement of an $11 million Project Eagle grant and the development of St. Petersburg College's online education program, currently the largest in the state. And whereas Dr. Oliver negotiated and planned the Seminole campus's joint use library with the city of Seminole, the first of its kind and a model for the 21st century, he was also instrumental in the development of the college's university partnership center, which is housed on the Seminole campus. And whereas Dr. Oliver has assumed a leadership role in St. Petersburg College's initiatives for workforce development, working with the other provosts to provide on-target and necessary educational training that leads to productive employment for our graduates, and whereas Dr. Oliver has made the Seminole campus an important part of the Seminole community, building partnerships and coalitions with business and civic <coughs> leaders and opening the campus for numerous civic events, as a result, he was named Mr. Seminole by the Seminole Chamber of Commerce in 2008. Over the years, his transformational leadership style has touched every part of the campus and the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and to the community by Dr. James Oliver and extend to him our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead said resolution being adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees this 19th day of May, 
as they say on TV, but wait, there's more. Um, a career of this impact and magnitude uh, earns uh, some special recognition uh, in all of our hearts. And uh, we uh, early on started thinking, what, what a way to memorialize the service of Jim. And it, your memorial is, is fitting and, and it touches students' lives. And I wish I had thought that one up first. Um, uh, we decided that when you think of the Seminole campus and you think of the impact and you think of the attraction that, that has, has come to this campus and you think of the uh, innovative style of, of uh, Jim Oliver, that the uh, most fitting tribute <laughs> um, is to name the digitorium for Jim Oliver. That is not photoshopped. That's, <laughs> that is up. <laughs> Let me read. With nearly 45 years in higher education, Dr. James Oliver served St. Petersburg College from 1989 to 2015, setting the standard for excellence, innovation, and leadership. During his first seven years at SPC, Oliver served as vice president for institutional and program planning, he helped secure an $11 million project to EDA grant, and was a driving force behind the eCampus, Florida's largest online campus. In 1996, he was named provost of the Seminole campus. We've gone through so many of that. Development of the media-rich digitorium for campus and community events, creation of the Career and Entrepreneurial Center, development of the 40-acre Natural Habitat Park, expansion of career services and orientation, hosting of the 44th U.S. President Barack Obama in 2012, <coughs> Institute for Street Strategic Policy Solutions in Village Square, collaboration with the City of Seminole for Joint Use Seminole Community Library, negotiating free PSTA bus services for SPC students, sp partnership with Duke Energy to install solar energy panels, the Seminole Conference Center, the Sem Seminole Innovation Lab, promotion of advanced degrees through the University Partnership Seminole. Jim, that's the biggest plaque I would buy, otherwise we'd have more <laughs> stuff on there, okay? Um, congratulations. Uh, you know, Jim, the... Uh, uh, so many are here today who, who you've touched the lives and, and, and we know you so well. Uh, in our industry, the highest compliment is people who don't know your name have had their lives enriched. Congratulations. Okay. Take, taking the mic one last time. You know, this is, this is uh, uh, so incredible uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so touching. I, I'm usually not at a loss for words, but, but when, when it comes to the digitorium, uh, some of you, many of you attended the campus reception for me. I've, I've got tribute fatigue, as you all know, and, and uh, Jonathan outed me. Jonathan Sullivan outed me because uh, he talked about when he joined the team a few years back, and he walked into the digitorium, and there was all this promise of the digitorium. Uh, and uh, he said that there was not a digital component in it. It was, it was the analogatorium, and I told him at the time, I told him at the time that calling something the analogatorium just wasn't, wasn't working. Uh, and uh, so look, I, I, I am incredibly grateful uh, and humbled uh, to be here. Um, I, I've had uh, the perfect spouse uh, who stood by me. Um, you've kidded me about the emails at midnight. She's been on the receiving end of not having me um, while I've worked very long hours here um, with you to make the magic happen. Um, I can't thank the Board of Trustees and Dr. Law enough for providing the, the, the oversight uh, and the direction, but allowing us on the campuses to make the magic work. Um, I, I can't thank my colleagues enough. Um, the uh, provosts, um, who I think we've worked together on a college experience that's second to none, uh, our members of the community um, who've been outstanding, uh, the city clearly a, a partner for the ages, 
um, as well as our partners in the county and the civic organizations. Mr. Edelman is not only a city council member, but he's also the president of the Chamber of Commerce on all the partnerships we've had there. And, and then, of course, all of you who've been so much a part of what's made the Seminole campus and the college great. Um, um, we, we, uh, this is an academic institution, Dr. Law, so I, I have to quote, I have to quote uh, uh, some poetry. I, I noticed that Dean Campbell is here, so I'm going to quote a couple of great poets from our generation, Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, uh, in, in, their, in their classic rock poem, The Boxer, uh, and uh, that song ends, you may recall, I am leaving, I am leaving, but the vision still remains. So thank you all for being part of the vision and for carrying the vision on for Mark Strickland and those who will follow behind. It's been a great ride. Thanks to everybody. But wait, there's more. We... Um, we asked Jim to send us a photo to, uh, that we could put here, and he sent us, Doug, go ahead and click. That's the photo Jim wanted to put. Charm realized that probably wasn't appropriate, so she said, Dr. Law, do you have a photo of Jim that you could share? And we found another photo of Jim. <laughs> um, in, in the end, we decided to let Jim do his own thing, okay? Jim, thanks very much, okay? They are going to t pull this out as soon as I take my seat and install it. It's ready to go, okay? So after the, the ceremony, if you want, you can go to the analogatorium, okay, <laughs> and, and see it all. Jim, thank you so much. Thanks, great. Thank you, sir. I guess we're down to comments. Uh, Ms. Bello, do you have any board comments? Huh? Any board comments? Mr. Oliver. Uh, just, uh, just a couple. We had a great graduation on Saturday. Um, graduated, I think, about 1,000 uh, folks changed their lives. And then also, Jim, uh, congratulations uh, and uh, uh, well-deserved and, and in kind of moving into this phase of life. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as, as it appears as much as you've enjoyed being the provost here at Seminole and, and all you've done. Thanks for your service. Mr. Gibbons? Um, yeah, we had a great... First of all, let me um, ask everyone to apologize. I've been on a field trip since 7.30 this morning and I'm going back with my son after this, so <laughs> excuse my dress. <clears throat> but um, uh, great graduation Saturday. Um, uh, Mr. Oliver and myself and uh, Mr. Lang... Uh, passed out the uh, the, uh, the the degrees, and uh, it was the most students I have ever seen, and most parents. That, I mean, the the, the uh, audience was so filled that they had to open up different areas within the dome uh, for uh, family and friends. Um, and Dr. Law, you and your staff should be commended. Um, Dr. Cooper and myself and some other folks counted the amount, amount of minorities that went across the stage, and we lost count. Um, that's how good of a job this college is doing in graduating minorities. I mean, we lost count on Hispanics and Asians, and I want to say there was over probably, we lost count on African Americans at about 160 or 200 almost. So we are, we're definitely, this board should be proud of the work that it's doing um, because we, we really, really, really have done a good job. And to Dr. Oliver, you will be missed. 45 years is a long time, longer than I've been alive. <laughs> You've been doing this. I think you and Tom Furlong probably been doing it longer with Dr. Law. So you ask if that rock man could be you three. <laughs> um, but thank you for the service that you have given to this community and this county. And, uh, you know, Dr. Law always says, you know, you're judged by the people who don't know your name that you touch. And um, you will be touching the next generation of students, which is very important. And you have provided a good groundwork for this campus to be um, uh, changing lives in, in the future for a very, very long time. And we appreciate your wife for sharing you with us. Um, we know that's difficult because you, you work long hours and you do a lot for this community. But thank you for your service. We appreciate you. And we'll, you will be missed. Thanks. Thank you. Other than, there was, there's Jim. Other than to say thank you for everything. Um, and best of luck. Um, I don't have anything else. Mr. President, 
Um, uh, I want to compliment my staff on graduation on Saturday. Mm -hmm. 995 people walked across the stage. Uh, it was as friendly, fun, and uh, certainly orderly as, as we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just, uh, we, we can, I, the largest graduate, the, the largest number of uh, degrees awarded, a thousand people walk across the stage. Uh, if memory serves, it was just under 2,300 degrees that we had awarded in the spring semester, 650 uh, bachelor's degrees. Mr. Gibbons, I received an email from one of the, um, the baccalaureate uh, students in the education program asking me if we could consider a master's level program. So I'll, I'll, when we meet mm. with Senator Negron, I'll, I'll bring that up, okay? In fact, why don't you bring it up with him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, we should, uh, it was a proud day for all of us. Thank you for, for all that we do. Anything else, sir? That's it for now. Okay. No public comment. We'll move to uh, the minutes if there's a motion. Move that we accept the Second. minutes from April 21st. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's moved. Monthly reports. Hello. Uh -oh. Good morning. Good morning. I don't have a report this month. You're alone at your table. I am. <laughs> so we're down to faculty governance organization. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mercadante is here. Good morning, sir. Good morning, uh, board members, Dr. Law. Thank you for a few minutes just to share with you an update on what the faculty have been doing. Uh, the faculty have been very, very busy. And I want to point out uh, two ongoing projects we're involved in. First of all, the uh, online revitalization, uh, as you know earlier, this semester, uh, all faculty completed training in the new My Courses Learning Management System. And many are currently involved in actively <laughs> developing standard courses for online, uh, which should be released in the fall. And that has just, uh, uh, just begun. We'll obviously release many more in the future. So uh, many of those faculty are uh, working with uh, uh, design technologists to make sure that these courses are uh, SPC student specific. Uh, I think one of the, uh, the best qualities of these courses is we're not outsourcing this. We're actually sitting down and having some of the tough conversations about what do SPC students need to be successful in online courses and how do instructors uh, approach those students and approach those courses so we get the best success out of them that we possibly can. I'd like to commend Dr. Susan Kaloric, uh, who's been uh, overseeing this with online. She's one of the best administrators I've worked with, and I really appreciate the collaboration she's given uh, with the faculty on that. Uh, many faculty are now involved in a course called Teaching an Online Course, uh, which was designed by an organization called Quality Matters. Uh, and interestingly, and I think this is a, a good gauge of the enthusiasm of the faculty, uh, the first time the college opened that course was uh, 6 a.m. And I'm told within 20 minutes it filled. <laughs> and then they opened several other sections, and within 24 hours, those sections filled. So I think there's a sincere commitment on the faculty's part to make sure we do online education right here at SPC, and we're really headed in the right direction there. Uh, secondly, the improvements to faculty evaluation process. Uh, as you know, we kind of revamped that process. We put in an uh, uh, annual evaluation which will focus on the Faculty 180 software, which is a, an electronic portfolio. So throughout the year, the faculty member enters uh, anything that they've accomplished for the year, things like out-of-class support they've done, conferences, publications, uh, participation in committees, uh, student evaluations, and so forth. So when the faculty member sits down with his or her supervisor, which would either be a dean or program director, and most will be doing that uh, this summer, uh, they will be focusing on this Faculty 180 so they, they can have some dialogues between each other as to what's going you know, well and where they need to improve. And I think that's the theme that FGO has tried to, to carry on. We want good dialogue between faculty and administration, and especially we want faculty members to be able to uh, dialogue with their uh, deans or program directors so that there can be clarity and that there can be improvement in the future. That's all I have for you this morning. If there are any questions, be glad to answer them. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Moving next to uh, the budget. Good morning, Ms. Connor. Good morning. 
Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Law, good morning. Um, I'm Jamel Connor, and we'll be going over our current tracking to budget for this current year, and then look at how we're progressing for developing the budget for the coming 15-16 year. As we look at our tracking for this year through April, we're running over budgeted revenue trends by $800,000, and our expenses are actually running $2 million before we budgeted to have them at this point in the year. So overall, from a revenue perspective, we're right on track with budget at 84%, but you can see below that our tuition um, due to enrollment growth is actually running 96% um, versus 95% of where we had planned to be. For our expenses, we're 1% below budget on those, and you can see that offsetting the lower current expenses are the personnel and benefits, which are 2% above budget. Again, that includes the uh, recognition payout that occurred in December, and then you can see with the adjunct expenses tracking to date, they're fairly in line as well with what we're seeing for overall personnel considering that payout that occurred. <coughs> So right now, when we look at our revenue over expenses, we're at a fund balance of $8 million. But as you can see, the trends and what we're expecting to have happen in May and June, we'll still have revenues occurring over these next two months, but we'll also have additional expenses. Our regular recurring expenses, we'll be getting ready to, to um, get all the classrooms and everything ready for the fall. And then we also have um, one-time expenses for the year that will hit, that will bring us closer to a zero fund balance. Also, just to highlight, um, this month, we wanted to look at the lab fee trends. Over the past three years, we've worked really hard at reworking how we calculate lab fees and what lab fees we're charging and where we can fund the costs of labs to lower the cost to our students. So just to highlight that, um, over that period of time, 57% of our lab fees were either decreased or eliminated, and a total of 165 courses have had those lab fees eliminated. And then also, although it's not a direct correlation, if you took one credit hour of the lab fees of where they were before we made the adjustments and added those up from just a numerical perspective to where we are today, it's an $8,000 decrease just from a numbers perspective. Any questions on where we're at for this year? I, I'm going to ask Jamel to kind of draw that up because when you have your conversations with the governor, I mean, everybody's, he's, he's very focused on the cost of education for students. And I think we've done a spectacular job of, of managing those costs. And, and our, our, the governor always says, what do you do for me lately is, is the nature of those discussions. But I think lowering the, the incidental fees in 165 uh, uh, courses and, and making go away for a third of the courses is is a pretty good accomplishment. It, it gives us more planning power, gives students more control over over their knowledge. And again, we went through and said, what are all? If we add up all the lab fees that we're charging for every single thing, we've reduced by eight thousand dollars the total lab fees uh, that, that are in our inventory. So, very proud of that work, and it has paid dividends for us to strengthen the uh, curriculum across the, the campuses. Thank you, Jamel. Mm -hmm. So now on the process of developing the 15-16 budget for the coming year. This is the slide that you saw last month. So we haven't been able to solidify what our funding is going to be from the state. Um, but this just shows that we have about $2.5 million right now we believe is available. That includes the enrollment growth that we anticipate and have seen this year. Does not include any new enrollment growth for next year or any changes in the state funding, either performance funding or our regular program funding. Mr. Chairman, let, I, I want to just go a little bit slowly here. So we, we planned a 3% enrollment growth, which would produce $2 million in tuition, tech, and learning access fees. You see that uh, in the second line at the top. Because we are cautious about that, you see us create an enrollment reserve in exactly the same amount, <coughs> sort of below the line. So while we anticipate that we will grow, we have not built a budget counting on that growth as part of the operating thing. So that, I think that's conservative picture number one for what we're trying to, uh, to accomplish. The top priority for the college is looking at an employee compensation increase for the coming year. Um, as I've mentioned before, every 1% of increase college-wide amounts to $1.2 million. So if we're looking at a 3% increase, we need $3.6 million. Assuming the $1.4 million that we've seen in enrollment growth this year to offset that, that currently is looking at another $2.2 million we need in recurring funding to be able to do that. 
in addition to the compensation increase, based on the board workshop where you set forth our strategic priorities, we work through our budget requests and prioritize those. And there's $1.8 million of initiatives that we'd like to work on for the coming year that would come from our operating budget that would require funding. These I went through last month in more detail, so I tried to kind of summarize it on one slide. But just to hit some highlights, for the college experience, that includes the advising model, which the associate provost will be giving you a more in-depth presentation on after mine, um, enhanced disability resources support, and also expansion of the Women on the Way program across more campuses. For academic and instructional enhancements, there's very targeted multiple areas there where we're working on improving support for student success, over $400,000 worth that's both in and outside of the classroom, and also the next year of our online revitalization program. Community initiatives is getting the new Midtown facilities opened and operating, as well as support for strategic collaborative lab engagements in the coming year. Marketing and strategic communication includes the communication and relationship management system that we'll be working to implement. Employee professional development, highlighting that is the career service evaluation revitalization that we've been working on. And then in looking for strategic enrollment growth, we really want to put some resources to focus on improving first time in college student completion rates. Jamel, let me, if you'd go back to mm -hmm. that, uh, I want to add just a, a couple of things as, as we've talked through. Um, Jamel has given a, a high-level overview. Some of these, uh, for instance, online revitalization is already funded. You did that when you adopted the plan a year ago in January. We, we funded that through the first three years of, of that plan. So that's already in the budget, and that one is is taken care of. The new Midtown facilities and security needs, that will be an off the top front end uh, allocation by the legislature. So we list it because we, it's going to be in our budget, but indeed we know where the funding is coming from for that particular model. The CRM we've talked about a number of times and some of that is offset with grants, some of that we've already uh, had in the budget. The, uh, the employee professional development, one of the things we had is great success with the creation of our leadership academies. We're going to have a special leadership academy, which is what we added here, uh, to support our um, advising model. We want to have a special leadership development uh, initiative for the managers in the uh, at the very beginning of that effort. So we, we added a new Delta Academy for that. So um, as you see, inch by inch, it's, it's a very robust budget, but uh, a good part of it has already been identified and funded. In addition to those items in the operating budget that we'd like to fund, we've also looked at initiatives that we could fund from other funding sources. And that includes, we found about $950,000 worth of items that we have other sources of funds for. For college experience, that includes working to decrease the loan default rates as well as working on our career centers. For academic and instructional enhancements, the corporate training expansion that you heard about a few months ago at the board meeting, as well as increasing study abroad opportunities for our students. Um, the Center for Civic Learning and Student Engagement, and then also um, enhancing support and opportunities in industry certifications. On community initiatives, that includes expanding our ecosystems with our K through 12, and then also working with principals at high schools to offer scholarships to students to bring them into St. Petersburg College. So currently, with where we stand in our funding and not knowing where things are, this is what it looks like. We have the $3.6 million for the compensation increase. That's offset by $1.4 million of current year FY14-15 enrollment growth, which leaves us the $2.2 million I mentioned before. On that first slide, there also was another $1.1 million that made up the overall $2.5 million of funding available. That gives us $1.1 million that we're looking to fund as well as our strategic initiatives for $1.8 million. So as we're looking to find out from the legislature what we're going to get, we're looking at $2.9 million to fund everything that we would like to do for the coming year. Once we find out from the legislature what we get, if it is less than what we need, then that's when we'll have to step back, look at our priorities, and consider those initiatives, and then come back to you in June with what our plan would be and our proposal. Um, also, for this month, I said that I would bring back to you the revenue estimates for our other funds. 
Our student activity fees we're projecting next year to be up by about $200,000. Our auxiliary fund, which are sources other than our core mission revenues that come into our college, I'm esti estimating right now to be fairly flat to last year. Student financial aid fees will be up about $200,000. And then our student capital improvement fees are estimated to be up at $2.2 million. And most of that will be directed towards the building of the Clearwater Library Project we'll be focusing on in the coming year. Next steps for our June meeting, we've got the special session coming up in Tallahassee. We're expecting that will end on June 20th, so that will let us know our state program funding, which includes our regular program funding, our lottery funding, as well as what's going to happen with performance funding. And I'll also bring you the detailed full budgets of our other funds, capital outlay, student activities, auxiliary, and financial aid. Jamal, back up three or four slides, if you would. Okay. Um, Go back one more, right there. Okay. So the budget we are presenting to you in all of those many categories with all of those initiatives require $2.9 million in state revenues to execute that plan. The earliest uh, estimate that we got from the state seems like a lifetime ago, had more than that in it. So we, we, we had worked on a budget that said, if we got $3 million from the state, what would we do? So the, the plan that you have is based on the information, good, bad, or in between, that, that evolved over time. So we now have a way to monitor how we're doing as we're working through the, the June 1st to 20th legislative session. If our number says, you, you know, you always read from the bottom right up, I and mean, if you find the St. Pete College line and it says 2.9 million, you have seen the plan. If it says something less than 2.9, we've already taken the steps to, to identify where we would pull a million dollars out if, if that's necessary, okay? So I, I think uh, all of those, uh, pulling it out just means we change the time frame, we change a little of the scoping. All of the projects, though, remain viable to, to move forward with. So. So in round numbers, we need the state to provide $3 million to execute the plan that we have. You see it's a robust plan. You see it follows, I think, the, the general categories that we've talked about since December. In fact, for, for several years, I don't think there's any new or different things there, but we're getting pretty focused as to what we do. Just want the board to understand how you know, we do this every day, so sometimes we get to talking in shorthand and we can talk past you, and I don't mean to do that. But we've been pretty careful here to, to leave us in a way that we can move this forward very effectively, uh, given uh, any reasonable, uh, <laughs> excuse me, any reasonable response by the legislature uh, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, that's the framework. Please take whatever questions you have. You, you've seen it. I've had a chance to meet individually with, with uh, many of you to try to make sure you have a sense of what we're trying to do. Happy to have your questions and comments. Questions? No? no. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I just I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to meet with most of us personally on this and to, you know, keeping us up to date and educate it on this whole process. There's still time, you know, this is, the board will meet again in June, so our plan is always to give you what we believe is a finished budget in May, and in good times we can adopt it or, or otherwise move it. Happy to reschedule, a, a couple things didn't work out just the way we wanted to. Um, I, I, why don't we do my comments sort of toward the end as to okay. what happens next? Okay. I don't want to confuse this. I see the college th th experience. these guys are so, they got dressed up. Who knows what time they got up this morning? Okay. <laughs> they, 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 they practiced yesterday, and Tanja took them out for a little extra practice last night or so. I don't know the whole story, but they're, they're ready to go. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Board of Trustees. Dr. Law. To my left is Rod Davis, Associate Provost, Tarpon Springs Campus. To my right is Mr. Clinton, Associate Provost, um, Midtown Campus. My name is Karan Jean-Baptiste. I am the Interim Associate Provost at the St. Petersburg Gibbs Campus. I stand here today excited to introduce you all the new advisor model. This new model focuses on student success. The model, as the model rolls out, um, see that it addresses many of our current student needs 
And most importantly, this model is sustainable. As we go through the model, please note that the students online will receive the same exact services as the students on campus. So students in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end will, be, will receive the same services and will be just in time. This next slide illustrates the shift in advisor responsibilities. As we look to rebrand our advisors, we're looking to change their titles from student support advisors to career and academic advisors. In order to do this, we must align their job title with their responsibilities. How we plan to do this is by providing additional training in the career area for all advisors. Um, Tyrone will go through that later on in his presentation. This model also addresses our retention and intervention with students. In the past, our in intervention and retention efforts consisted of phone calls and emails. This new model through the Smart Start orientation allows us to strategically approach these students differently. What we're gonna do with the Smart Start orientation is all students returning from suspension and dismissal will be required to take the Smart Start orientation. These, this, this orientation will be taught by our career and academic advisors, okay? This is a four week orientation that will focus on the keys to success and this is our way of reaching out and giving them the same love that a college experience gives the first time in college students. Many of these students miss this because they came prior to the college experience but now we're bringing it to them. This model is very proactive, started in the fall. All students who are first time at SBC will be required to take the Smart Start orientation. This allows our advisors to develop that important rapport with the students. We know that the data tells us that the, four, the first four weeks of class are the most critical. We're bringing the information to those students during the first four weeks so they can use it immediately towards success. This model aims to pull students to, excuse me, pull students through the educational pipeline towards success. Our advisors with their enhanced training will be able to provide less referrals and handle more of the career conversation, resume building, and other essential parts to being successful in college at the time that a student sees them. Although career and acad academic advisors are still the subject area experts, we are looking to shift some of the ownership over to the students. We feel that by empowering our advisors to teach our students more We'll shift that responsibility and we'll see a better product. We also set an expectations to guide this model. These expectations will develop a paradigm shift in behaviors from our advisors. What we're looking to do is develop two individual teams during non-peak time. One team will focus on admission, one team will focus on retention. These efforts are very intentional and there will be some deliberate overlaps um, in terms of what they do. We want our admissions team to understand that retention starts as soon as a student inquires about St. Pete College, not when they enroll in their first class. For our retention team, we need them to understand that you will have the same level of training as the admissions team in the career piece as well as the academic piece and that is the key piece that will help our students turn around and, and, and reach good standing again. Good morning, <clears throat> and in addition to what Mr. Baptiste stated regarding the advisor expectations, the new advising model will also address student behaviors. In this model, the, student, the students are expected to assume the responsibility to their successes through smart start orientations and courses. Utilize the extensive college resources via the advisor avail availability and focus. Respond, respond to faculty and staff in a timely manner via, via our retention outreach. In order to better serve our students and focus on enhancing the student success at SBC, the advising model is centered around a modified organizational structure that will be rolled out in the next two years. The proposed plan looks to address two key areas within the next two years. Year, year one, 
increase the number of students who succeeded in transfers or are placed in a job by expanding the role of the advisors and upgrading the position to the administration level. Year two, we plan to streamline the leadership of advisors and improve the staff focus during non-registration periods. By adding a manager to address the retention and intervention efforts and services for our students who are struggling. This modification will allow our advising teams to better serve our students by focusing on delivering effective student support services at the front door for Smart Start and also increase retention and placement efforts through a more outreach case management efforts. The significant changes to the advisor role, role required skills more than just a paraprofessional. It requires a skill that is a critical thinker, case manager, and a career facilitator. For this reason, the educational requirements are of a bachelor's degree. Currently, 86% of our advisors meet or are in progress of meeting this requirement. And a plan has been created to address the bachelor's degree requirements for advisors. Thank you. So let's talk about advisor certifications. <clears throat> Just as we want to ensure that the advisors are well equipped with their proper academic credentials, we want to more importantly make sure that they are well trained. Mastery of skills empowers advisors to make sound decisions, which in turn allow our students to become more self-sufficient. The certifications and trainings will be required to, be, to, co to complete will be prescribed on an individual basis. Advisors will work with their supervisors to set, set up plans geared for success, geared for their success. Fundamental to any advisor performing their job is having mastery of all SPC processes and procedures. Examples of such procedures include, but are not limited to, my learning plan development, and focus to knowledge. Nationally, training offered by groups such as the National Career Development Association and NACADA, which stands for the National Academic Advising Association, will serve as strong foundations to the development of academic advisors. So what's the cost of all this? With this new model, we'll be reclassifying advisors from career grade level six to administrative and professional level one. As a result, the cost incurred is at approximately $400,000. We will phase this in over a three year period, 40% distributed year one, 40% year two, and the final 20% year three. The three-year disbursement is very similar to that of faculty some years ago. After each year's junction, advisors will be required to meet specified expectations previously established. So what are our next steps? Not only will it be necessary for advisors to be trained, supervisors will be trained, will be required to be trained as well and lead the implementation of this model. A formalized job description is complete and ready to be shared. A communication plan involving the who, what, where, when, why, and how is also prepared and ready to send out. And finally, we will be returning to you in approximately one year to confirm the college-wide implementation of our retention managers. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? Questions? Just, just a, a, a comment. I, I think this is a great thing because this is really, you know, all about what we do, and it's about how we take, you know, either kids out of high school or adults who are are kind of got left behind or whatever and decided to go back to college and and really trying to help ensure how they can succeed by giving them a plan and you know, telling them how they can kind of march forward with this and be successful. And I'll say, you know, Dr. Williams, you know, the things that we do today are very successful. And I think, you know, I've been approaching, and I finally figured out, I think, why 
uh, our pictures are posted outside it so people can recognize you and ask you questions at the grocery <laughs> store and at restaurants and stuff. But, you know, I'll say that over the last several months, um, and I don't advertise that I do this, but um, over the last several months, I've been approached several times by people who have been out of school for a while, come back, and sat down with the advisors and had a very positive experience, not real, you know, really kind of staying away from school because they thought it was going to be negative trying to get in. But it was really a positive experience. They were given a plan, told what they needed to do, and then they just, you know, it's up to them to do it. But if we can do things to enhance that, to make it even better, it might be kind of interesting to see, you know, knowing what our success rates are now to post implementation, kind of measure our success, success rates post to see really which pieces work, which may not work, and where we get the most value out of this. But I'll tell you, what we're doing today is working uh, as evidenced by, you know, kind of the, the comments that I get just on the street unsolicited uh, by folks. So job well done. And I, I look forward to kind of seeing this move forward to really kind of boost that from where we are today. Um, the benevolent dictator in me loves this. Um, I absolutely love that it's required. Um, not that I think this is our way of saving some that we might have lost. Um, do I think most will probably jump on and take the opportunity to learn? Absolutely. But I also think there's a few out there that might tell us they got it and they don't got it. <laughs> um, so I'm absolutely thrilled that, that we're requiring this of folks coming back, you know, and, and our new, I call them kids, but our new students. Um, and I am absolutely excited for our next set of statistics to see what kind of an impact this has had because this is, this is really a, a fantastic program. Sir. Number one, great presentation. Two, I am in definite agreement with Ms. Westheim that I'm glad that it's mandatory, but I'm also glad to see we upped our game and it requires a bachelor degree. You know, the, the higher quality of person that's going to be dealing with these folks and getting them into where they need to go is, 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 uh, is key and the training part of it is, is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Well. Just one question. Uh, do we have enough advisors, or is this the budget? Don't ask that question. There's Don't never enough. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's uh, we never have enough. Yeah, think, think of a, the, the biggest number you've ever heard, and that's the, how According many to who you are. <laughs> <laughs> 70 plus advisors. Well, I, in fact, I made a note though. If, if, go back just so, so that we can get a little, the, the org chart slide, uh, Tyrone, if you would, just so, so the board can get a sense right there. H how many career and academic advisors are going to be in that, in that yellow box? Is it, it's like 130, 140 or how? No, initially 70 during, 70? during, not, during um, non peak time, and then we'll, um, sorry, during peak time, and then during non peak times, we'll kind of divide them up into the appropriate the areas. Okay. Yeah. Good. The, the, I'll, I'm going to add one thing. They, they have put a lot of time and energy. I've met with them two or three times. The, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the presentation gets better every time. Um, all of this came from the work at the board to encourage and support and, and push in the workforce piece. When we got serious about helping students with workforce, we realized we didn't have the skill set at the advisory level to carry that through. We're real good on transfer. That's what we've done for 85 years. And as we have grown that commitment, we've had to grow our skill set. And this is what it looks like. Instead of hiring people who can only do one thing, we're going to hire people at the next level who can do a variety of things. And that's the game plan that we're working on. You hear the, the, the renaming of it, career and academic advising, so that there's no only career over here and only academic over here. Everybody does everything. So the, the, these, the, the associate provosts have done a great job of owning this issue and, and crafting a plan, and I heartily recommend it to you. It's phased in so that we can measure the success of it, and we, we've learned to calibrate. We're really good at mulligans if we have to do some parts again, but um, it, 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 three years from now, we will be at the spot we want to be, all baccalaureate. We'll be very competitive at the highest levels in the market. We'll have a fully trained uh, group that, that can help us in, in a variety of ways. Thank you for your work. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you. Next on the agenda, uh, human resource report.
report. You can all read that. We can have a motion. Of I move that we accept the human resources report. Second. Yeah, I motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's it. And we have a presentation for staffing priorities, sir? Yes, somebody's going to fire up. I just wanted to take a who's they told me there is a Ah, there we go. I, I wanted to take a second with, with the board. Um, obviously, we've had a, a high amount of turnover with, uh, with Provost moving on and then with uh, Dr. Nicotera moving and then some, some changeover. I, wanted you, I just want to take a moment with you to say we have a game plan for replacing folks over the next six months to a year. We're trying to be deliberate about it. This is absolutely the worst time to get upper and, and middle upper uh, folks to come to your college. They, they're already committed to their home institution. Uh, you, you get people who may have been released from their own contract back somewhere else. The best game is to, to give, uh, you see a, a variety of people who have a chance now to, to develop some new skills. They've earned their way into these interim positions. And then starting after Labor Day, on a, on a discipline plan will advertise and, and fill the positions. But uh, along the way, you see some, some names, people have done really good work for us. I want to take one second. Tanja, would you, uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Eric Carver, I, I think just, I, I want to be sure that we highlight um, uh, Eric's work, if, if you would. Well, we're very pleased to have Dr. Carver as our interim provost at the Health Education Center. Eric's here, yeah, I Is saw him. There he is. Come on up here, okay. Mr. Carver comes with um, a doctoral degree from Nova Southeastern. He has academic and student affairs experience, has even worked in financial aid and with Veterans Affairs. He's also been an officer in the um, military, the reserve, Air Force Reserve, Air Force reserve and um, was recently the leader of our CETL program, which is our center um, for uh, teaching and excellence. And you know that, that title. Um, but we are very pleased. He knows the health programs. He's familiar with the community and is going to be a very uh, good uh, leader in our, in our health programs for now. So thank you, Mr. Carver. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so we have a, a, a number of key positions. They're all, all the interim folks are, are very skilled and, and, and have, have a chance to do that. Uh, I, I just didn't want the board to think that we're kind of making it up as we go. We're, we've got a plan for, uh, for replacing some key positions. Uh, you see the honors program, that one will probably move a little faster than, than some of the others. Um, but if you hear of anything, we'll, we'll keep you advised as to when the, the national ads will go up. In almost every case, we'll be doing regional or national search for these these positions. Some are in there. I mean, Mark uh, Strickland, uh, as, as you know, is, is uh, taking over here. Mark is technically on an, uh, an interim he's, as he's uh, solidifying his, his doctoral commitment, and, and we're happy about that. So uh, again, just an abundance of caution for the board. We are well set to open the doors in August. We know we've got good people in all of the key positions. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, the consent agenda. Are, um, are there things you'd like to highlight before we just move to? If no one wants anything pulled, I would move approval of the consent. Can I have a second? second? Properly moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Consent agenda. Sir, we're, this is a quick board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me your report. Um, I. Once again, I, I had to send everybody an email. Here is, uh, unless something changes, and it could change any day, uh, the, the June board meeting, we've vetted the budget for the most part, so, so we're ready to go. I, my suggestion is still that we have our regular June board meeting at the end of the meeting, simply suspend it for a time certain, reconvene briefly when we know exactly the number. I think from the time of the board meeting and before the end of the month, we will know exactly how much this, the state does. That's one. If indeed, and we don't have confirmation on this, if indeed we can send in a budget to meet a June 30th statutory deadline that is not specifically tied to your appropriation, 
then we may not need that June, that extra June meeting, okay? I, I trust me, I, I, we're juggling it as hard as we can. Uh, that when the governor started talking about the continuation budget, it, uh, n nobody knows what it means, nobody knows what it entails. Uh, we, we have confirmed that the chancellor, and, and again, there's a new chancellor, has the authority to set a deadline for the submission of the college budgets, and that's the thing we're, I'm worried about. We have a legal responsibility to submit a budget. Here's the, here's the, the kind of the frustrating part, M maybe more than you want to know, but our number one priority is the implementation of a, of a pay increase for our, our staff on July 1. The law says until your new budget is approved, you are only authorized to maintain current expenditure levels. And we don't know if that precludes awarding the, the modest pay increase? Does that exceed the level? Or do you not exceed the level until you have spent more money next year, in which case it'd be June of next year before we actually spend more money? Um, uh, we, sh we shouldn't have to be dealing with these things, but we do, and, and <coughs> trying to award the pay increase clean on July 1st. We've got some people earned it, let's do it, not then have to give post-dated checks or whatever, the catch-up monies or those sorts of things for a few bucks. Stick with me. I suspect once the legislature gets back into town on June 1st, things will shape up. But currently, we, we cannot get better answers than I'm giving you, and, I, and I'm sorry about that. So um, I think that's, that's it. Yeah. Any other comments from board members? No? We're adjourned until June 16th. Ooh.